Thanks, Uta. Wow, what a wonderful audience. I can see all of you. Hello, I have a story to share, and we've heard some wonderful stories today. So this is my story, and hopefully we find our common points through that. Once upon a time, there was a man, an Austrian, who loved all things mountains, rollerblading, and heavy metal music. We won't get into the la last part. He met a girl from India. They fell in love. And even though he was from Austria and she was from India, they shared a common passion. That was a love for outdoors. She was a runner, and when she would go to the park opposite their home running, he would join her rollerblading. And every time they passed each other, they would give each other a high five. That's when they felt really in sync, two people in a relationship. So time passed, he was not feeling so well, something was wrong with his heart. He started wearing a pulsar sensor on his wrist to keep track of it. One evening, he was cycling back from work, crossing London Bridge. He suddenly felt his heart beat very rapidly, it was quite high. He checked his pulse sensor and it said it was 200 beats per minute and it wasn't coming down. Alarmed, he flagged a cab down, which took him to the hospital. They admitted him in the ICU, where they fitted in a pacemaker, an ICD device into him. He was 35. So that's Alexander, my husband, I'm sharing the story about. And now we are three in a relationship. Me, my husband, and the pacemaker. It's a bit crowded, I know. And sometimes now, when I'm running alone in the park opposite our house by myself, I get these thoughts. These thoughts about algorithms and the relationship that people have, like my husband has with his pacemaker on a daily basis, the relationship I share with my husband and how it's changed us because of this thing and what that means for cities itself. Because it's not just the pacemaker at night when we sleep. The data from the pacemaker goes to this box below our bed. I know it sounds a bit dubious, but there is this box which is connected. And this data then gets synchronized, all the data of what Alexander has done on the whole day gets synchronized with the cloud, where all those data points get aggregated, and the algorithm that is governing the pacemaker is tweaked to improve how it works. And this is just not people who are wearing this device, it's also patients who have asthma. There is a project for people with asthma when they actually inhale with their inhaler, they're able to share those places where they've taken a breath, and that talks to their phone, it's connected. And then the phone tracks all those hotspots where in the future, if there's going to be air pollution or hazardous air conditions, these people who have shared their data can get to see that part of the city and avoid those parts, or just get mentally prepared for those parts. Isn't that fascinating? Because who would have thought people algorithms and cities can actually change the way we interact with each other and how we perceive cities themselves. So I'm a designer and I design systems. And in my quest of designing systems, I've tried to understand a bit more of what an algorithm is. I am not an expert. I'm not a software developer. But because I'm developing these things as a designer, I have to deal with the logic of it. So an algorithm, because I just tried to explain to my mother the other day what I was going to talk about, and she said, I don't know what you're going to talk about. What's an algorithm? And an algorithm, actually, the name itself comes from the Iranian Arabic mathematician astronomer. His name was Ibn al Asar. I can't pronounce his name, the Muhammad Ibn Musa al Qarami. And if you bastardize that a bit into an anglicized form, it becomes an algorithm. Trust me, you have to go and look this up. <laughs> and <laughs> it's in Arabic. And uh, if you think about algorithms, they're basically logic. They're a series of step-by-step -step instructions to execute a function. So let's take an example, right, that we're familiar with. Let's take the tea algorithm, because I'm from London, and we all drink copious amounts of tea. 
And funny enough, the T algorithm in London or in Britain is slightly different from the T algorithm from Mumbai, where I originally come from, or the T algorithm from Japan, where there's a completely different ritual. So back in London, if I'm having tea, what I would do following an algorithmic process is I'll put the kettle on, I'll go and locate the tea bags, it should be PG tips. And once the kettle is like, the water is boiled, I'll go and put the tea bag into the cup, get the water and the tea to brew for a bit, that's very important. You can hear lots of complaints when it's not being brewed well enough. PG tips needs to be strong. And then, the last part, the milk. Guys, remember? There's a whole debate. There's also an article in New Scientist about this. The milk comes in the end. Yeah. And that's what makes the tea algorithm coming from London. And what's interesting is these steps and logic is replicated in software, in all the kind of systems that we're using on an everyday basis. So let's take this back to us. There is 500 of us who made it successfully to this TEDx Hamburg talk, and we all came in different ways. So I'll take my story. I'm curious where you guys come from. So I had to put an alarm on my mobile phone in the morning because it's one hour earlier to wake up. Then I went for a run because I know we're going to be sitting in the auditorium for quite some time, and because I'm a bit of a geek, wanted to get on my steps, my step counter high. And then I used Google Maps, even though we were kindly escorted as speakers, just curious where I am. So I used three apps, or three pieces of technology, or three different algorithms to just get here. How many of you have used any apps or technology just to get here today? Show of hands. Yay, analog, organic. Look, we're all using this stuff. <laughs> organic people using technology, anyway. So what's interesting is, um, all of us have this kind of technologies around us. And if I think about things like how we interact with the city and these technologies, so I have an Oyster card, and I travel in London sometimes using this Oyster card. And it's interesting, it's got an RFID chip, and it also has a credit. It knows that I have to, every time, touch on the barrier. It sees how much credit I have left and lets me through. Now, because I'm a bit of a forgetful person, and I don't always remember stuff, Sometimes I don't have enough credit on my Oyster. But what's really sweet, sweet sounds a bit odd, but what's nice about Transport for London is they let me through and complete my journey. I get a little message saying, you are now negative £2.40, please top up your Oyster card. So this kind of makes me feel happy. But it's not some benevolence from Transport for London. It's not that, it, hey, Priya needs to have a good day. It's not about that. There are so many other people who exactly are in the same shoes as me and have given their data about having this last part of the journey which cannot be completed because they're all running short of credit on their Oyster card. So by complete taking all this data, Transport of London has created this pattern, this model about our habits and behaviors, and somebody in the systems there has designed empathy into the algorithm to allow us to get through that last mile. Business model works. I'm still using the Oyster card. And you can see this. This is also happening in other kind of platforms, Netflix. Many of us are on Netflix. My husband's into action films, I'm into comedy. But sometimes we get so bored with the same recommendations all the time. Don't you guys all have that? It's kind of really painful with the Netflix algorithm. So the other day, we just had to watch Titanic together, gritting our teeth, just to kind of you know, put the Netflix algorithm in a convert <laughs> scent. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we would just get. <laughs> So we would just get something new and trying to game the system, you know? So we all do these things. But what this really means is it comes down to relationships. The relationship I have with my husband, the relationship I have with my Oyster or Netflix. And again, going back to a personal story, the other uh, two years ago, my husband came back very happy from the hospital. He met a new nurse, not that she was nice and good looking, met a new nurse. And she looked at all his readings on his pacemaker and said, oh, you've got to change your settings. Apparently, your settings haven't been tweaked for the last three years. He was like, OK, let's try it out. And suddenly, he was a new person. I kid you not. He had more energy, and our relationship changed. Suddenly, we could do many activities together, we could, which I could not share with before, because the pacemaker settings was actually set in the same pace for a long while. So that makes me think again about these relationships, right? These relationships we share with humans and how all these, what is the meaning of all of these relationships and the way technology interacts with it? 
because um, Robin Dunbar, the British anthropologist who has studied primate behavior, kind of extrapolated from that and looked at villages and how villages run. And he mentioned that 150 is the magic number. So I understand that we have 500 people here. So out of 500 of you folks today, you will only be able to have 150 meaningful relationships. A quarter of the people here will be able to meet and have 150 meaningful relationships. What does a meaningful relationship look like? It's not my 600 Facebook friends who I rarely touch with, or those 1,000 LinkedIn contacts, no. A meaningful relationship is when you and I have a chat, a conversation, we have a dialogue, I say something, you say something, some exchange is happening. And that meaningful relationship can only be shared by 150 people. So you know the situation we see sometimes, you're in a restaurant, you see this couple in front of you, she's on her iPhone, he's on another phone, and they're both stuck on their screens. What's happening there, guys? You know what's happening there? Even though they're together on that table? Facebook is the 148th relationship. Twitter and WhatsApp is the 149th and 150th relationship. So they have relationship with the Facebook, Twitter, and WhatsApp algorithm, not the humans, not their partners who are sitting in front of them. And this is interesting because as a designer, we're constantly designing systems where algorithms are replacing people. Like my father from India, he loves going to the banks and chatting up the women. I always say, come on, Dad, you can't just keep going to the bank to meet all these women bank tellers. And like, no, no, I have a really good idea of the financial situation, and I speak to somebody who's human. I just have a Natris app on my phone. So I don't have that relationship of this bank teller or the bank on the high street. It's, for me, it's an app, it's an algorithm. So what you see is slowly cities will be having more and more algorithms running those roles that people used to play, and the relationship we shared in the past is going to get replaced by algorithms. So I won't share the relationship my father has with this bank teller ladies he meets back in Mumbai. I have a very different relationship, but it's with an algorithm. So what this means is, when I think about designing for cities, and I've been spending quite some time using my own neighborhood as a lab back in Camberwell, where I come from, is how can we actually try some experiments and see how we can change the relationship or create new meaning of relationships with people and algorithms so they can come together and do something. So in Camberwell, we have this post office, which has been slightly disused. There were a lot of people who are unhappy with the state of it. We decided to try this experiment where we got a grant from the government. We got 10,000 pounds to come and change it. What we did was we worked with artists. The artists were crowdsourcing what kind of issues and anecdotes people had about the post office. That became the artwork on the post office. We put Wi-Fi there, so suddenly a lot of older generation who are not exposed to digital services would come there to pick up their pension and benefits, started getting exposed to Wi-Fi. But slowly what happened was, just yesterday we had this inauguration of an artist showing their artworks there, and we had all these people we had older generation, we had young people, we had people who were on benefits, all sitting on the sidewalk, having a cup of tea, because it was in the morning, the post office shuts at one, and actually having a conversation. What we had done was created a place in the public where suddenly you could form new relationships with people, which did not exist before. And this gives me hope, because last year I was here in Hamburg. I came for a workshop and was basically about understanding the hopes and fears of Hamburg as a smart city. We went to this neighborhood in Shanze. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> Apologies if it sounds like something else. So we, I was in this neighborhood, and I was looking at, you know, speaking to people and asked people, have you heard about smart city? Nobody had. But when you ask people, so show me something that is smart around your neighborhood. We went on a walk, and we came across this community garden. Again, it was a disused piece of land, but people had organized themselves, had figured out who needs to do what. They put these kind of flower beds and they put these kind of um, uh, vegetable patches. So this was the Shanza community bed algorithm, right? Somebody had put some logic step by step on how to make this place a better place, and it was working there. 
And we're taking this same kind of logic where people come together and do stuff to also solve some wicked problems like the one we have right now. So Martin was talking about cycling. I'm a cyclist. And one of the things that we have faced in London recently is a lot of cyclist deaths. So we've created now a pilot for Changeify Smarter Streets, where cyclists can come together and report those issues take by taking photos of potentially hazardous situations. And then we've created a voting algorithm where they can vote up and down those issues that could become potential accidents. And this then gets sent to the city authorities who act upon that bottom-up intelligence in real time. So, I've given you a bunch of examples, and the reason I'm calling this Citizen++ Plus Plus is because I really don't believe, as citizens, that we only get every four years to make a change when you vote for your government. I believe that we as designers have a wonderful opportunity to create and design new kinds of meanings, new kind of human relationships, to create better, smarter, future communities. And the community doesn't have to be smart, as in technologically driven. We are just optimizing, we are taking all the intelligence we have as people through our own experiences. But at the same time, we are also working with algorithms, the digital entities. So it's people, algorithms, and citizens coming together, cities and citizens coming together to actually solve some of these most pressing issues that many of my colleagues have been talking about today, whether that's climate change, whether that is, I don't know, dog litter down your street, it doesn't have to be bombastic. You can do this by following very simple steps. And I think as designers, it's our responsibility to kind of create this new kind of engineering of human values into these algorithms that are going to be driving the cities of the future. Thank you.